someone like me who did run for office win a seat, uh, an elected seat, I can tell you that on the day that you leave, you're the happiest you've ever been. You know, on, on that last day, you're like, oh, I'm free. So anyways, it's a great thing to talk about today. It's Freedom Friday and you are still not free, but hopefully you're going to be freer after this hour with Sharif el Meki and me. Today, we're going to talk about the power of politics and whether or not politics uh, helps us in some sort of way to unlock everything that we care about in education. Uh, some, some, some people say uh, it's not worth the hassle. It's not worth the time. When, we, when you talk to elected officials, they tell you all about the trials uh, that they face in trying to do that job. It is Freedom Friday and you are still not free. Sharif el Meki, my brother, how you doing, man? Good, man. Doing well. Good to see you. And, back um, in the world, back for, in the United States. Yo, bro, back, back, back. It felt like it was a World War tour. Yeah, man, you went a lot of places. Boy. I looked at the pictures. I was laughing because I was thinking to myself, the next picture we're going to have of Sharif, he's going to be on on Mars uh, <laughs> because, because uh, <laughs> you know, he, <laughs> we had pictures of you b- before uh, pyramids. And uh, I know you, d- you did some island stuff. Did you go to Dubai? Uh, Abu Was that Dhabi. one of your places? Yeah, yeah Abu Dhabi. Really? Yeah, went to start a spiritual journey in Medina and Mecca. Then went to Cairo, and then swung around wow. to Abu Dhabi. That's amazing. Yeah, that is amazing. Uh, uh, you know, I saw the, the one pictures. disappointing part it was an amazing trip, Chris, and you you yeah. appreciate this. I mean, the part that I was disappointed in was they don't seem to eat the ungulates as much as they used to. The so, what? The ungulates, like the dromedary. <laughs> what the hell is that? The dromedary. The what? The, the camel. Like Bruh, it was. What? It was harder to find, <laughs> cam, you know, camel steak and stuff. Like when I was younger, that was much more pervasive. You know, now it seems like everybody wants to be sophisticated and only eat lamb and cow and like yo. The 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 dromedary is essential, bro. It's essential. Stop it. You know, uh, I, I gotta I've been to off the meat people. for a little while now. I, I've been done with the meat for, oh, for yeah. a few weeks again. Yeah, like trying to get my heart right. Mm, um, you know, one of the things that I noticed uh, with Josh, when Josh has uh, gone over there in his pictures, and then I think it was somewhere else I saw in a documentary, uh, I saw a picture of the, the uh, pyramids, and then they panned back to what's like right by the pyramids, and it was like a KFC. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was like like yeah. fast food. I was like in the yeah, it desert. Yeah, a little crazy. <laughs> like if you come from one end, the highway and everything is like right up against it, you know. And they said, you know, part of – we actually asked about that. And part of it is just the population growth is, you know, 25 million folks. And um, yeah, just in Cairo, uh, which is just like – busting out you know we always think about like new york and how huge it is but you know you look at places like cairo and shanghai and tokyo like they make new york look you know um pretty pretty spacious. small comparatively yeah spacious yeah you know what's um, funny uh what's interesting and we should come back to this as a topic in a future show um uh just to talk about like the the thing that happened with egypt last year i think it was when uh kevin hart uh, was going to come and they made him cancel his show because he had made a comment before about uh, Egypt having black roots. And this was around the same time that they were fighting uh, against Netflix for the movie that Jada Pinka Smith was uh, producing. And she had cast Cleopatra as a black woman. Mm-hmm. And they had official statements on all of this. They had, they felt some kind of way about us keep trying to claim uh, oh. Egyptian was black and black roots. Mm-hmm. Apparently, they they forgot all about the Kush dynasties. Uh, oh yeah, and, they, they, you know, they forgot about all that. the like you know when they were ruled by Southern African. Mm-hmm. Um, they forgot all about that. But but whatever. Convenient. Let's come back to that. Ish, <laughs> it looks like Ish is in the house. Good to see you, brother. How Good you doing? See you too. Doing doing well. Doing well. How about y'all selves? Well, we haven't got arrested yet for teaching black people stuff. So, you know, so we're good. <laughs> Keep living. Keep living. Yeah, it's going to happen. Uh, according to uh, Nimrata, who is running for office as Nikki Haley, uh, America is not uh, a racist con- country and never has been a racist country. It's funny. I saw Roland uh, Martin talking about this, and he he played a clip of her saying that. She said, America's never been a racist country. Blah, 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 blah. Um, I mean, listen, I'm a minority. I experienced some racism when I was coming up, but we're so much better now. He 
he showed the clock it was 10 seconds between the time she said America's <laughs> never been a racist country, but she faced racism as Nimrata when she mm. had her real name uh, coming up. I feel like there's something that happens to people when you go into politics and we should talk about politics today, whether it's not even good, whether it's even an avenue for us to get power uh, in education, because it doesn't feel like it anymore. But I look at her, I look at Vivek, I look at Bobby Jindal before who ran for office in Louisiana, became the governor. They had to do so many kind of like uh, transformational um, acrobatics to get that probationary white uh, license that they have. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just probationary. It's probationary whiteness. I mean, it can be revoked. Like, let them say anything. That's why they're so clear. When the camera turns on, they're like, oh, no, no, no white people is good. Uh, no, 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 no. No, America's great. You know, because well, they can't say anything else. They have no thought freedom. They, they can't say anything. Um, so I wonder what, what y'all think about politics it's a it's a political year it's a political year where there are people running for office is that really a source of power for it and how come the two of you have never ran for office only one of us on this podcast right now ran won served retired so uh i'm, I'm kicking it to you two brothers have you just not seen politics yourself as as a avenue towards how you think we can get power it's ran it's ran it's type of politics he ran did he so is <laughs> yeah, Did you? Uh, yeah, I ran for a uh, leadership role in uh, the Philadelphia Federation of Teachers Union twice, wow. 2016, 2020. Okay. Lost both times. Um, and then after the second time, they kind of try to hide me. You're like, oh, he's too radical, but like we need his type of vote. So like, let's have him on the ticket. But like they asked me to cancel my social media. I was never able to recover my Twitter handle at that point, which still upsets me to this day. Actually, it doesn't really upset me anymore. But like all that happened. And then I realized that wasn't my fight. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, um, and, mm -hmm. and even deeper than that, because the idea was traditional politics. I agree with you. I, I'm skeptical um, uh, of it being a real vehicle. But I thought, well, the largest union in the city of Philadelphia mixed in the second largest in the state of Pennsylvania, if it really truly had a vision and rooted in social and racial justice that could produce real change if that power was wielded correctly. Um, but I definitely learned my lesson about that. So. I wonder about that issue. Like, um, did that sour you for good? Like you did, you said you did it twice. Does that mean like you, you're like, I'm done with this? Well, yeah. Uh, you know, I realized that that's not my base, you know, 69% of, uh, you know, members of the PFT are white women, um, mm, which mm. is all well and good. I can probably talk and convince like a little less than half of them. But when it comes down to it, like they don't want this type of like real conversation. Also, many folks don't live in the city. Um, and then it, the pro the issues and everything that folks wrestle with on the day to day in that capacity, when it comes to actually serving the children of Philadelphia, there's like a cognitive dissonance and the distance that happens. And I learned from that point that that is not the role to go, especially when it's talking about impacting uh, the youth that uh, needs to get impacted, uh, the communities that need to be involved. And that when you just protect the interest of few who really aren't aligned with the interest of the community that you serve in, um, there, that, that disconnect uh, for me doesn't seem reconcilable at this point. Wow. What about you, Sharif? I, I mean, it, seems like you would be asked to run for something <laughs> because you're around so much. Yeah, no, I've, I've been invited to run um, everything, you know, for school board, which was not really run, but, you know, to, to apply to be on the school board to city council. Um, I just don't, I don't think that's my, my lane, man. I, I think for me, when you, when you work with directly in classrooms and schools and you had like able to, you know, you just felt like, you know, when the, by the time the bell rings, the classes are about an hour long. By the time the bell rings, sometimes you had to have decisions made and plans starting to be implemented, if not implemented. And you had mm -hmm. these kind of hard deadlines to get stuff done, right? Like, you know, I mean, I don't usually curse, but when I do curse, it's like, get shit done, right? Like as quickly as possible, um, as effectively as possible. And I, I don't always often see 
politics as a lane to do that. Like it's the long game and game. The emphasis is on game, right? Like I, I just, I, I don't think I have the, you know, the uh, fortitude to play that many games on a day to day basis. Like, oh, this one, oh, they got to run it out. Oh, no, this, you know, the whole politics, you know, and mm-hmm. I, I understand mm-hmm. political being political, but playing politics for me is a, is a, is different than um, being political um, in in so many ways, and you have to do that. It seems, um, you know, I, I respect the folks. I do think it's an important part of the ecosystem um, that we need in order to to you know move things along. But I, I think just being weaned, or being you know, being nursed on activism and grassroots and those kind of things, it's just. It's like harder to fathom, you know, um, thousands of hours of meetings and not much get done, getting done. Um, like to me, that's I hate meetings. Number one, so can you imagine? <laughs> I hate meetings. Like, like I like yeah. I like the work. I like meetings that are actually producing work. But I just can only imagine the amount of meetings that politicians sit through. I mean, you see it on C-SPAN. Mm-hmm. I'm like, what the mm-hmm. hell are y'all doing? Like, just make a decision, get a plan, who's accountable, and when's it? The next meeting should be about accountability, like how much progress has been made. <laughs> you know, um, that's what the meeting is supposed to be for. So for me, um, but shout out to folks like, you know, especially the, the uh, I used to be a part of this group, David P. Richardson group. You know, uh, Mama Fasaha and them had had formed, a, you know, uh, formed that group. And, you know, this is part of like their, you know, uh, crew. Uh, growing up. So being able to see that and what that meant. Um, I could have been a politician in the seventies back when our city council was like rumbling, you know, sucker punching mm. folks on the, on the, on the, on the mill, <laughs> with mill in John street. Like maybe, maybe yeah. back then, but you know, <laughs> you said just, what? Uh, wow. I wonder if we have any evidence that it's, it changes anything. I mean, I look at, we are always told that voting for the is worst there. sometimes. Yeah. It feels like, when you just said the games and the politics that people have to play, it feels like once you get elected and you get in on the inside, there's one thing that you learn first amongst everything, which is everything is a lie. Like it's all for cameras. It's all for behind, behind closed doors. People don't believe anything that they say out front. They know they're playing games with each other. They know they're playing the public on things. And it's a, it's a shared secret between both sides that, uh, that, that, when they when the camera and the lights go on and they have to talk to the public, they've got a certain set of things that they just have to say whether they believe them or not. And I faced this. I shouldn't say I faced this. I learned this um, in running through our Democratic Party machine uh, in Minnesota. And, you know, when I saw how things go down, how people vote, how they get pushed out front, who who gets whose time it is to run for a yeah, different thing. Yeah, they need your turn to how, run. It's not your turn, how they kneecap people, how they um, like, you know, if they, they don't want the wrong person in there, how they try and, you know, uh, get people out of the race. I watch people try and get uh, um, uh, Keith Ellison out of the race when he first ran the first time. Um, but we're smiling in his face. Oh, we love him. We love Keith. You know, he got the endorsement of the party and everything. And they took about trying to get him out of the race because he was a Muslim. Right. And they didn't think that a Muslim could take the seat of a good Sven, a good Lake Wobegon person that he would he would have been replacing. And there was a sense of like, it's not your time yet. And we get to decide whether it's your time not to run. Uh, it's not just democratic. It's not just like brothers walking in off the street saying, hey, I'm going to you know, I'm gonna run for city council. So I wonder if we have any evidence that what if we just stopped? I know that we're always talked about, like, as the people that saved democracy, we saved the Democratic Party. But what if we just stopped? What if we just, just stopped didn't disengaged do it anymore? Totally. Yeah. yeah, just not vote, not like not give money. Don't when these folks come asking for our vote and telling us how bad the boogeyman is on the other side. If we just was like, uh huh, sure. And kept walking. Right. <laughs> uh, and I mean, then what? What would happen? Anything? Yeah, I mean, I th- well, it's a couple of things. I, th- I think one that takes it can't be cavalier. Like it takes such a level of organizing because I do think you would want if you're doing all of that, it should be for a third party, right? Just to detach and still be basically saying like, oh, acquiesce and say, yeah, you know what, y'all, because part of that detach it means, hey, do whatever you want. You know what I mean? And not having any kind of push or force or voice. I'd be, you know, I'd be reluctant to be, you know, um, 
I'd be really skeptical about that being successful because you're just they're going to elect somebody still. Um, and if you have you no kind of like leverage, carrot or stick, not that it but, works, but not that it this, matters so, a whole lot. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> I was going to say like, and it's, you know, I saw you maybe want to jump in here, but what are we getting right now? That, that what, what is it that we're getting? Well, the scary part, I think um, back in the day, you had brought up the fact that you, you had this data for the percentage of growth of black candidates in our cities but then the stagnation in black communities like that's supposed to probably the most damning, but it also speaks to the overall system. So you can, you know, change the decor, but the engine is the engine, you know, and you're not close to the engine. Um, you know, you're not, you don't own these multi-billion dollar corporations. So that means you're not close to the engine, even if you are, your face is hanging up in certain buildings. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and I, I just want to veggie back off of that. You know, the the, uh, Bring the black veggie, faces. Bro. In, yeah, man. Bring the ranch. <laughs> um, <laughs> like the <laughs> the uh, the the overemphasis of even black candidates could also be used as okie doke, mm. right? And we see this in the sense of uh, tokenization, right? Um, even what, with my own small microcosm experience, I witnessed tokenization. Oh, well, we need to get more black people or brown people into this. Uh, we can't seem like a white organization, right? We can't and seem it isn't like the, it. <laughs> yep. And, and that's what I'm saying. Like that language was used. And to see that even on a smaller scale, I can only imagine what it is on a larger scale, right? And even when we're talking about it, the disengagement, I would, isn't it like 50% of black people don't vote? Um, and the young generation might be is, generous. yeah, 50 might, might be generous. And then the younger generation is not like really voting or engaged in it at all. And so like when you're talking about that, we are kind of witnessing it, but it is unfortunately uh, uh, related to disillusionment. Mm -hmm. It is related to kind of powerlessness. Like what's that going to do? Mm -hmm. Disenfranchisement, right? And so like when we're even speaking about this stuff, the reality is that is happening. And what are we going to do about that at this point? And Sharif, I co-signed that idea that we need to dislodge ourselves from this like two party system, which both of them are trash. I mean, come on now. If it's going to be Joe Biden versus Joe, Donald Trump again, who, who co-signed that? Yeah, and, but, and, and but then no you're alternative. Russ Romney. It's going to be <laughs> two brown VPs battling it out. That might be interesting. Uh, <laughs> I mean, and, know and then don't even get one. me started Who's on VP Kamala. Is browner? Like who's VP? Yeah, is Dan? Don't, don't don't get me started on Kamala because even that that's a a, a repre, you know just because you represent something and the iconography and the image doesn't mean that you represent the ideology or the politics of kind of the intellectual genealogy and heritage when we're talking about black radical politics, right? Or when we're talking about folks who actually stand for transparency and democracy by any means, right? Like I don't know if those folks actually stand for it. I think and you're so wrong we're there. I saw her put her pinky finger up on TV. Time, so. <laughs> I mean, you, pearls you and chucks, line, right? Bro. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So but that's some key facts about uh, black folks. Um, uh, black eligible voter population in the U.S. is projected to reach three, 34 um, million in 2024, and that's going to be up 7% from 2020. Um, the exact numbers are there are 34 million, 34, uh, five, almost 500,000 uh, million uh, for Hispanic voters, non black, non white Hispanic voters, it's 36 million, which is a new number. That's a number that changed over time, which is why we are becoming a, a relic minority. We were the legacy minorities. We were the we were the prominent, dominant first minority that made America do well by minorities and other minorities lived and died off of that. And they enjoyed uh, they enjoyed building themselves up all the time that that was helping them get government contracts, uh, better houses, better loans, all that stuff. Uh, and then they turned on us. So there are 15 million Asian uh, voters the population change of about 2000. The growth of, of Asian voters is 15%. The growth of Hispanic is 12%. The growth of Blacks is 7%. And 92% of Black single race voters, non-Hispanic Blacks, uh, cast a vote for Democrat Joe Biden, while only 8% back Republican Donald Trump. That's according to Pew Research Center. Um, 
that's a that's a startling uh, kind of putting all your eggs in one basket type of thing, possibly because you don't know any other thing that you could do. Um, Black Americans are projected to account for 14 percent of eligible voters in the United States. And when you think about it, uh, we are so um, I think in our head about how dominant we are, we see black people all over the place. We see black people all over the media and owning media. We got Jay-Z and Beyonce. And of course, those are the like proverbial ones. You always mention them because, you know, they're billionaires and and Oprah and, and Tyler Perry and whatnot. And, you know, there's a black person that feels like on everything. We're 14 percent of this thing. When it talks about like if we ever had a street fight with white America, <laughs> they can win just on numbers, not on like not on even like technically knowing how to box, right? Well, that's what these elections win. are. These elections are street fights. And they, you know. Wow. Wow. That's a way of, I hadn't thought about it true, but politics has been before called what? It's like, uh, it's like war yeah, without war without shit or something. Um, here's a startling statistic. As of 2022, about half of eligible black voters live in one of eight states. Wow. One of eight states. There's some states where we just don't exist. <laughs> uh, lots of them. I mean, wow. Yeah. That is uh, that is so crazy. So anyways, that 92 percent. What if that changed? What if I said this year? Listen, uh, I have voted libertarian. I have voted third party. I'm a member of the Green Party right now. Uh, I'm being like uh, over the Who's last two election that? cycles. SDI? I'm being lectured to. I'm being told. You know, and and I'm not one that has to be lectured to because I do fall in line if I think like we're under attack or something like that. Um, so the last election, I, I just felt like, you know, yeah, I usually do that independent stuff. But this time around, this is too crazy. But I don't know. I don't know this time. I actually like, you know, I might listen. If I really think about it deeply and I went with my heart, I can't vote for the, the Green Party because I know they're going to pick somebody crazy. Um, it, the party just has a habit of doing that. Like they pick the craziest people, um, which is why I think Dr. West, Dr. Cornell West, um, started with them and then was like, yeah, nah, y'all crazy. Um, but yeah, it might happen that I go for Dr. Cornell West. Do you know how bad of lectures I'm going to get if, if I say that? Well, I guess I just said it publicly. You just but said it. Here yeah. Do you know Wait, how bad? He, I thought he was running for the green party. So what party is he? He's starting no. a new one. I think he's independent. Um, so okay. yeah, like uh, he he started with the Green Party, and I think there was another the Working People. No, he started with the Working People's Party. I think something like the Workers People's Party, and then went to Green Party, and then decided to go independent. Sounds like um, a lot of indecisiveness so, for a potential president. <laughs> okay, stop it. Uh, listen, listen. Next, he's gonna go to a birthday party. You know. <laughs> Here's here's what I think uh, about this. And I'll ask you guys, like, first of all, you know, I'm going to get lectures. But the, the second thing I would say is um, um, if you don't vote for people, if you vote for, for platforms, mm. if you vote for policies, you would probably vote differently than what you're told to do every every election. Like if you just voted for the who's got the best issues, like the best grasp of the issues you care about, you probably wouldn't vote for the mainstream candidate. At least I wouldn't. I can't speak for you all. I can't speak for other people. But um, maybe I just got to vote my heart this time. So, <clears throat> or maybe not vote at all. What do y'all say about that? What if I just say we shouldn't vote at all? We should just leave that alone. Leave that voting to other people. It's complicated. I mean, look, I, I shared Ooh, this both book. of y'all. Just I saw the face. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just because it's it's like, and I was there before. I mean, I was like in my youth, in my first initial voting age. You know, like I, I was definitely step back, like ah, oh, this is all a racket. Y'all go ahead and enjoy your little circus. You know, this fake stuff. Um, but particularly, and I, I feel much more strongly about this locally than, than, um, you know, nationally, you know, locally, I, I, I don't even contemplate not participating in that, you know, I, and we need the, you know, um, Isaiah Thomas's and, uh, you know, um, you know, the, the folks like, you know, like that, you know, um, to be involved, you know, and, you know, a young man who's, who's, you know, grew up in the community, was a former educator. Now, you know, in there, you know, Jordan Harris, you know, um, Senator Hughes. Like, so we have folks who like have been fighting for things locally that are important. And, and it's a long game. Again, like that, that impatience that I talk about, like Senator Hughes has been battling folks about the 
school funding for as long as I can remember, you know, um, and and that's just been a continuation. And so, like, now we may get, who knows, because nothing's ever certain, but, you know, the, at least a court said, like, hey, this is unconstitutional. Doesn't mean anything's going to happen anytime soon, but, you know, without that kind of, um, you know, policymaker also being aligned on that issue. I just, you know, I, I don't, I don't see how that happens. Like, yes, we need to grab, I just always think it's a combination of stuff of grassroots as well as, you know, um, you know, folks inside those, those rooms, you know? So I think if you have a combination of that and strategy um, with that, you know, um, then, then it's different, but nationally, yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit different, I think. <laughs> now, I, I want to co-sign everything you just said and also uplift uh, Rab um, and Kendra Brooks and Nicholas O'Rourke uh, in Philadelphia. Independ yeah, that, that was and, hard to do. You should talk a little bit about that because that was the first time in, in I forget how many years I read about Over 100. Um, yeah, so in our city council right now, there is no Republican at-large seat held. And so no, that's not fair, was, but, you know, that's... Uh... <laughs> No, I'm just, but but, but it's no, but, but it's just tell me we had they reserve a couple seats for the non-dominant party or the non what is it the, the party not in power the so party like, not in power. yeah that doesn't so each there's seven seats at large and only five of them can be held by one party and then the other two have to be held by another party no matter what but any party and by any party so in Philadelphia Working Families Party successfully ran Kendra Brooks last election, which was what, 2000, uh, uh, 2020, mm -hmm. 2019, 2020, and Kendra Brooks won the seat. And then this time, Nicholas O'Rourke, uh, as a partner in the Worker Families Party, won the other seat. So last so time it was one working party and one Republican and then five yep. Democrats. Yeah. And now, but now and Republicans, they, the first time they said, oh, we just didn't, you know, they, I mean, they took her for granted. They was just like, oh, this black woman, who is she? She ain't going to, and she, she slayed them. And then they're like, all right, now we, we, we playing for real now. And so they, you know, they all like, you know, started thumping their chest about what they were going to do and how organized and O'Rourke took that seat, you know? So, um, so there, there's an example of a third party you know, um, from the community, like engage with like what's happening in the community. And, um, where nationally, I think that's just so much harder because locally you can, you can organize, like she can get to like, for, for one, but like people knew Kendra Brooks because of her work in the community already. Right. And so then to say like, Hey, I'm running for, for office and here are my issues and here are the things that and that resonates, then it's easier to do that at a, at a local uh, local level. If you have a, I don't want to say loophole, but you have some kind of policy where it can fit in that way. I'm sure there are other places where the the barriers to something like that is so drastic um, that it might be a, you know a lot harder to uh, to to pull off. You know, I, I think um, it's been said before that, you know, 92% voting for Democratic Party, if some of those decided to start doing what Candace Owens has said, you know, like uh, the 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 black exit, the Brexit type of thing, you know, and start going over there, which I think th she's the one who scares me from it even being a good idea, because if it wasn't someone like her pushing it, I would say to myself, you know, you can't play where you're not at. So if a good number of black folks were uh, dominant in the Republican Party, like if a big number shifted over there, it would shift their conversations that they have over there. They would they would be needed. Like the reason they discount you right now is because you stopped voting for them in the 60s, 70s and 80s. And, you know, listen, go on YouTube, find some of these uh, uh Black Republican YouTubers, uh, uh, and they do stuff like they ask people, you know, that the Republican Party is the one that ended slavery. Ended slavery, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know the black, <laughs> you know, the Republican. Do you know that the uh, that the Ku Klux Klan were Democrats? Did you know that the people who started the Ku Klux Klan were Democrats? And blah blah blah. They they seem to be so educated on that part of history and so ignorant about the part when the parties flipped yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and when, when the Dixiecrats left the De Democratic Party and went over to the party that will welcome them with open arms. Now, 
it'd be possible for black people to do this, something similar going over to the Republican Party, knowing they're going to hate us in the beginning. They're going to hate us. They're going to like shout us down on things and whatnot. But if we're here and we're the voters and, you know, we start voting in some 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 not noticeable numbers or whatnot, they'll have to deal with us. And, you know, listen. Maybe it's a good time to call them on the carpet and say, like, listen, when they say, you know, we're the party that ended slavery, we could say, why'd you start it again? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, why you you ended it? It? <laughs> you know? yeah, why, why did you uh, why'd you take it off the shelf? Because, you know, yeah, you did end it. But then, you know, you started voting for some forms of slavery again, uh, including the war on drugs and many other things. You know, oh, we're the party that freed the slaves. Well, how come you're enslaving people again? Let's yes. let's. Yeah, I, I'm with you. Let's two million. Let's go back. I'm, I'm being jo- I'm joking because I can't see it happening. But. I do know that this 92% for Democrats is not in our favor anymore. Yeah, but don't forget, if it's if it's only 14%, even if half of them go to Republicans, that means it's even less power, right? Because 7% on that side means nothing. Well, and you know that 7% are that your That would be crazy added uncles. to the 8%. That's your crazy uncles, and that's your cousin who went to a PWI and got mad at black people because he couldn't date nobody, and then got a podcast and became that's Republican. That's why he became Republican. Right? Date yeah, them. yeah, yeah. You know, that's the brother that always becomes Republican. It's like it, it's like small energy. I'm not going to say what energy, but you know, it's 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 a sense of. Uh, it's our eunuchs. It's the black eunuchs, the black political eunuchs that uh, show up on that side saying, you know, I mean, God, we make everything about race. We just make everything about race. I don't see why we can't. It's just uh, I mean, God, guys, golly, golly. I mean, not everything can be about race. Really? It can't be in America. In America. Well, can mortgage rates be about race? Can uh, housing be about race? Can uh, can banking and business loans be about race? I think School science funding, would tell you that you're a fool systems. if you don't think so. Yeah, science, right? Sci- healthcare, wow. healthcare. See, there you go. Now you now you're taking science, taking science on. Um, what would you tell young people right now? More young people right now than ever. This is not something that I have any stats on, but I hear see it popping up and hear it in the media a lot now. More young people than ever are. Uh, um, disengaged with both parties. They think both parties are full of it. Um, the the true blue, I think this is more of a Democrat problem than it is a Republican party problem. I think Republican party is always going to get its Hitler youth that are just going to fall in line and be with the, be with the party because their moms told them to, their grandpas told them to, they got the American flag and that, you know, they've been indoctrinated since day one. Uh, Democrats don't have that same situation. Um, so for so many young people, to right now be talking about Biden is a total disappointment, whatever. That doesn't look good to me. I'm not a professional, but that doesn't look too good to me for this year. What would you tell young people? First, I would say that we need, and this is not what I would tell young people, but this is what I'll tell the older folks like us, right? We need to step away from this shallow mobilizing and shaming people into voting, right? Um, this I, I I forget who said it, but I, I remember Republicans fall in line, Democrats fall in love, right? And that model within itself with the Democratic Party with some like iconographic figure who's going to save us all and like heal everything. I think the Democratic Party like falls into that kind of salvation type of rhetoric a little too much. And instead of doing the hard politics, like Sharif was saying, of or organizing especially on the local scene, like if you give the most active youth I know who also are the most jaded with Joe Biden are the ones doing the organizing work. Those are the ones that are truly engaged, who do mutual aid programs within their community, have an analysis that is nuanced and changes. And then they they also engage in intellectual honesty. But majority of youth are just shown, be like, you need to register to vote because if Donald Trump becomes president, the whole world's going to hell in the handbasket not recognizing that Joe Biden's also a symbol of that also. And the youth do look at it like, oh, well, whatever they're talking about, at the end of the day, what's that going to do for us in our community, right? And I love that one meme where the hood the hood under uh, Bush, the hood under Clinton, the hood under Obama, the hood under Trump, the hood under Biden, right? It kind of looks the same. And maybe under Biden and Trump, you start to see some gentrified houses in between. But the reality then becomes is like, how do we actually engage the youth if we're not honest with them? 
and they know we're not being honest with them when we say when folks say things like that to them when they're just like hey you need to go out and vote and register because it's so important your ancestors died for it and all this and it's like yeah well that's all well and good but what did that achieve what did that gain right and there's no there's very few tangible things besides kind of tokenized positions of power that we can point to at this point right and when we're talking about wealth when wealth inequality around race when we're talking about income inequality when we're talking about access to housing and discrimination and banking like those things are consistent yet it doesn't matter if we have more black politicians in the office it seems those that role keeps on going on and even co- calls for brexit right that appeals more i would argue to some youth than calls to just fall in line and that even that calls like don't you realize you're running from one plantation to another And I don't think that folks are really truly being honest with the youth. And if we're not honest with the youth, they ain't messing with this. Like it's it's a complete disillusionment slash kind of what's that going to do slash, uh, okay, well, I don't really believe in you. What's you going to do? And and when it comes to national politics, I would say for the youth is like, you know, you need to get out there and organize every single day. You need to talk to your family members. You need to turn off the corporate controlled media, right? Of course, understand what they're talking about or whatever news story is the most popular, but you need to go out and read. You also need to go out and speak to your neighbors. You also need to learn about how these processes and systems throughout the uh, contextualization of history put us in the position that we find ourselves in today. And that's the first thing I would say. And if we're not even at that ground floor, we're just blowing smoke into the wind, in my opinion. Yeah, I feel like um, I did not know this, but the stat that I saw about youth engagement on national politics is pretty low. I think I just had it here. Um, It says something like this is a unique time of disengagement for young people. Um, uh, Their their paying attention of national politics has gone down substantially um, just in the last few years, actually. And I think it says... um, it went from 16% that say that they routinely pay attention to national politics to just 9%. And that's within the last two election cycles. So it's actually like, that's a pretty low number. First of all, like 9% of young people actually pay attention to national politics. There is something to the fact that all politics is local. So they probably organize around local politics more than anybody does. As a matter of fact, um, when you see local campaigns, you see young people all over the place. But in terms of national politics, if they're not paying attention that much and if the coalition is fraying. Right. So this is, you know, I I keep pointing this out because it's it's the way that I'm seeing things, you know, I'm analyzing things, which is that. Um, Republicans, uh, especially white supremacist Republicans have done a good job of doing the only thing. It's the way that they have ruled the world, the entire world, which is to get all the minorities fighting each other. So they've gotten black people to believe that, uh, illegal aliens, so-called illegal aliens are stealing their jobs. They got those illegal aliens to believe that the gay people are trying to groom their children. They got the white gays believing that, listen, we'll accept you as a white person and as a, a white gay person if you become conservative. So now you have conservative gays. You even have conservative trans people now. You don't believe me? Go go look for Blair White. Somebody go look up Blair White. Very, very dominant um, Candace Owens of trans people and has a huge following of super right-wing uh, white folks that uh, love her. Uh, and she's she's trans. Um, they got Asian people thinking the blacks are trying to steal your college seats and trying to steal your seats to get into high schools. They have now black people saying, see, y'all, uh, y'all stuck with them, Jews. And now when it comes down to it, they're not with you. They're with Hamas and blah, blah, blah. They've done a good job. And this is as a Christian, I want to say this is not stuff that I, I say lightly, because in the in the Bible, this is the um, these these are the main attributes of the devil in the Bible. Uh, cause scrutiny, cause acrimony, cause discord, put as much kind of discord in the air and in the water as you possibly can. Um, now, these are all groups that used to share something of a common coalition, um, people of color, BIPOC, whatever. And what Republicans have done is Republicans have seen like, listen, the writing on is on the wall. The This is late stage white supremacy. If we are going to survive into the future, we need to peel off the number of Asians that we can get, the numbers of blacks that we can get, the number of immigrants that we can get. We don't need them all. We just need their bigots. 
We even have Muslims showing up to school board meetings with Moms for Liberty to fight the gays in school. Now, the same people who are Moms for Liberty are the same people that were down with a Muslim ban not that long ago. But now you showing up with Moms for Liberty because you don't want your daughter to have a book that says she can have two mommies. This is what I think criminally insane people do. They figure out what your thing is, where your bigotry will lie, and then they exploit the hell out of it. And I feel like if you would have asked me five years ago, I'd have said, well, that's not going to work. I mean, people of color, we're, you know, we're sticking together. We understand the, the, you know, blah, 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 whatever. Man, listen, I learned my lesson. I think actually, uh, I think it's going to work. We have so many bigots in all of our populations, in our coalition. Um, their bigotry isn't the same. They just hate a different person. But they all have a little bit of antipathy for Black folks, including Black folks. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, that's what I was going to say. At least for the, the Muslims, their anti-Blackness, you know, uh, came way before Moms for Liberty. You know, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. you, you, could, you could see it in, in many places like where they own their, where they put their shop. They follow everybody else's blueprint. Oh, I'm going to put my shop here and give you some subpar food but i ain't gonna live here you know i'm not gonna help build this place up like oh yeah like no this is the blueprint that other people have used to exploit um and all right we have this one commonality wow. but uh you know uh as far as like you know uh rituals of worship but some of that some of the uh teachings doesn't go past their throats hasn't entered their mm -hmm. hearts and certainly hasn't entered their hands and feet as far as action so it comes out their mouth uh, really well, but anti-blackness has been pretty pervasive for for quite some time, you know. Um, and back to back to your point about the young people, I, I agree with Ish. Like, you know, my thing is not to shame them into doing thing. My thing is like, you know, the critical thinking is the most important part. I'd have them listen to Malcolm and what did he say about being a political chump? What does that mean? Uh, what does that mean to not be a mature voter? Um, and just having them think about that, because I, I firmly believe that you can be, um, you know, political and not just be blindly into politics. And I think often they want us to be blindly into politics, but you can be political adjacent to all of the mechanisms that they have. Um, and also when you talk about wielding power, the power comes from organizing, you know, um, whether it's in that formal sense that they think through. Or in in other ways, so that, you know, I, I would encourage them to continue to organize it, but also continue to be sophisticated and learn more. Not think, hey, don't think you you know everything about organizing because you're twenty and twenty five. Like you know, there are things to be learned. There's, uh, and it doesn't mean that you can't have coalitions that include folks who are in on the other side. The other side meaning in the policy space. You know, I, I, I would, you know, really encourage them. Don't shun all of them completely. Don't do anything blindly. Have a level of sophistication and critical thought um, and strategy and and strategy. Even at war, people pitch tents and bring white flags and try to negotiate even while everything was going on. You know, um, I remember when I was little and, you know, the Cold War and all this. And I remember somebody asked something. My mom would say, you know what? Even despite all this, America sends, I forget how many tons of grain to Russia during that time. She was like, so in the midst of like all the, in all the facade of like, oh yeah, they're, they're the worst enemy. She's like, they're feeding them. They had some kind of like issue. And so they were, while they're telling us all that, to you know, the Russians and they're going to blow up and invade America and all this kind of stuff. She was like, yeah, but. The white folks are making sure the white folks don't starve, <laughs> you know. So she's like, you can, you can hate them more than they actually hate them if you want. She's like, don't, don't fall for that, you know. So, mm -hmm. and, and I think that speaks to even what we were talking about earlier about how if black folks just decided to switch up, what you know they they might accommodate or you know eventually like listen to the concerns. It's like they leap, they're leapfrogging over black folks. They're going to the Latinos. Um, <laughs> You know, like if you look at the Latino numbers and their support of the Republican Party, they're making strides. I've heard uh, commentators talk about the increase in support of Latinos for Trump. So like these folks who are like first or second generation turn around and like, yeah, they're invading us and, and they're poisoning the blood. And they're like allowing this rhetoric to like run, run rampant. 
Um, and I think it speaks to kind of like this larger situation where, you know, there is already an existent anti-Black sentiment within all those communities. And they're manipulating those type of sentiments in order to like continue this thing. And even the language around, well, they're conservative. A lot of them are Catholic. You know, they're against abortion. They're, you know, against LGBTQ rights. And then you're right. That, that's used. That divide and conquer stuff is real. They did, they did it to the natives, right? You know, work with us and help us defeat this bad guy. And then as soon as you do that, we're going to turn around and take your land or what the South Africans did in Africa, right? As soon as they realized the white folks got together and was like, oh, if we have a coalition government, we can dominate the majority. You know what I mean? And then we're going to model this system off of what America created in Jim Crow South, just in a much more egregious way because we're just outnumbered that much. Um, Brazil made it illegal to talk about race until about the 1960s, after the end of slavery there. So you got to understand at the very root, there is an uh, uh, acknowledgement and even like a quiet kind of like uh, deference to the power that black people do have to shift. Even if it does only represent for 14% of the voting population in America, those eight states where folks are dominant, if black people just decided to like flip around and everything, that would mess up the whole equation from both sides. Mm. Um, but that's only eight states, y'all. <laughs> and then Republican what we're New Africa, about, but only, we only needed eight states. I think Republican yeah. New Africa was only the seven, eight, you know, maybe ten. I can't remember, but it wasn't that many. You know, what was it Louisiana to, to the Carolinas? Like, so, so I, think I saw. Oh, Chris, is, did you? you yeah, I think you sent something real quick. Um, you had mentioned that uh, I don't remember who was it. If it's Charles Blow, or Michael Harriet, or somebody who were telling people Charles to do the reverse. Um, great Charles migration, Blow. huh? Charles Blow. Charles Blow. The devil you, you mean know. to to go back to the south? Go back to the places where there you have a likelihood of being a majority, and then jumping into politics full, you know, fully or whatever. I mean, those states would just become a ghetto. <laughs> That's terrible. No way in the no world. Way. Seriously, that... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, so honestly, like to be very honest with you, um, there is strength in numbers. But anti-blackness as a business system in the United States, we're a starter market. So wherever we go is where people make their first money. It's where they make their first coin on their way to trying to get into the legitimate market. And, um, I, you know, ghettos, ghettos don't form by accident. I mean, we know this, right? History, ghetto, a, ghetto is a, a ghetto is a decision. A ghetto is a policy decision. It's the result of a policy decision. A ghetto isn't like some mythical place. It's it's a I mean, the Jewish ghettos in Germany were a designed thing. The word ghetto comes from the design of what Germany did for those people. Right. To those people. And uh, the United States and Germany were sharing uh, notes. They were sharing class notes with each other. Oh, yeah. They were cheating off each other's tests. Oh, oh, how are you doing segregation? Well, see, what we do first is, uh, well, we start zoning. And we make red zones and we make green zones and yell, oh, zones. Okay, I like that. I like that. Zones. We've got zones, right? And then America looks over and say, oh, y'all took our zone thing and really, and really yeah, yeah. y'all went a little too far with that. But let's pull back a little bit. You know, anyways, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm saying this in just that what we said in the last show about what Dr. Fuller says about us, um, the, the legacy of black folks, you know was learning at some point you had no chance of winning you had no chance of escaping so all you had was the hope to look to look you know forward um and you know extend the lines of hope because once hope dies you have no chance of winning no chance of escaping and you have no hope uh well congratulations you've just become a slave right um yeah so so this is this is I'm going to, you know, as we get closer to the end here, I'm going to like throw this on y'all. If I mean what I say at the beginning of this, that this could be a year to like just drop out. This could be a year to be like, listen, the last time around, y'all told me the world was going to end if I didn't do what y'all told me to do last time. Um, and I'm not real happy with the results of that, actually. Like, you know, we did get the orange, you know, Trump pansies out of the, the, the power seat for a minute. Right. 
But the Trumpanzees are coming back again, right? It's like Planet of the Apes with them, right? They're like looking like they're, I can't wait to take everything over again. You know, so so if I do what I say right now, I have to mentally be prepared of, okay, I know what that means, though. If I do that, that means I have to have a survival plan for living through uh, the next Trump, you know, uh, presidency, which, you know, there could be some implications to that that I'm just going to have to live with. Can I, can I live with it? Can I survive it? Um, because you know, having a last stand with the Democrats, that will be something that they will have to pay attention to, right? They have to regroup in some kind of way and start thinking through some other uh, worker-based, um, multiracial, uh, uh, class-based power system. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but before they do that, they might need to lose for a little bit of time. So what are we willing to do? What are we, are we willing to look down the barrel of the gun of, okay, if you do what you're saying you're going to do right now, Trump's going to be president. And that might mean something different for y'all. Yeah. I mean, what you said earlier, um, I think that's the reality of a lot of folks are thinking about where you said, oh, if you vote for Trump or you don't vote at all, um, it's going to be, life is going to be hell. And, you know, when you read the paper, when you're just in the community, you see a lot of people who are like, that's my reality anyway, you know, so they can't see the difference. And so they're like, well, the difference on that, it can't get much worse and everything can always be worse, but like how they're feeling and in such despair um, and, and um, disconnected from any, as you said, like hope that things are going to get better. It's hard for them to imagine like, okay, how does this, uh, you know, uh, get better, you know, incarceration, school funding, policing all this has happened in democratic places you know especially when when you're in a democratic city right and so if you're in if you're in you know uh spaces in philly that have you know had democratic mayors and governors and you're like hey well if the if the president is a is republican and you just you know i can imagine how many of them are like what like what different like i'm I'm struggling now i'll be struggling then what i'm familiar with what i'm intimate with is struggle regardless of who sits in that house and so i can imagine um that being a a unique challenge um you know but i i just i would say if if those decisions are made you know by individuals i would want them to do it <clears throat> from you know again critical thinking and not apathy um, I think, you know, you make your best decisions, not, you know, by just throwing your hands up and like, oh, F it, I'll just whatever, um, you know, uh, the critical thought. And if it's a reason that folks do it, then, you know, I, I don't agree with like shaming them and then being in the paper the next day. This is your fault, black man. You did this. Or that. You know, what I mean, all that kind of stuff. Like I'm vehemently against that um, because you had no engagement with them you know, the past 10 years, they've been struggling, but now all of a sudden you're like, Hey, well, if you don't do this, you're the bad guy. They're like, I'm trying to survive what I see right in front of me uh, right now, um, which is, we know short-term thinking and it's the reality for so many folks. They are, you know, hand to mouth. Okay. So I'm, I hate doing this to y'all at the end here. I'm going to like throw something at y'all. Like I, <laughs> our listeners should know to like, listen to the end. Um, <laughs> And and uh, I'm going to direct this Start at both show of you. At the end, but right? Ish, I want to know your response to this, right? Okay, so we say maybe we're for down for Cornell West. Maybe we want to go a different direction. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? What's the fallout? Um, I just heard you all just say a lot of people don't see how things could get better um, this time around uh, by doing the same thing that we've done forever. And I would say it's the opposite. I would say people don't see how things could get any worse. Mm. Like um, they're thinking it's bad already and it's been bad. And the idea of, yeah, but it, you could, it could be worse than what, what you have right now. Don't ever like get comfortable enough to think it can't get worse. But anyways, there's something called Project 2025. Project 2025 is a plan to reshape the, un the U.S. federal government to support the agenda of Donald Trump. Um, the budget for the plan is $22 million, and it's going on right now as we speak. And if you want to find 
uh, the, the public facing version of this, you can go to project2025.org and you can see it. It's a plan concocted by the Heritage Foundation mm -hmm. as a way to um, completely take over the United States, starting with the executive branch. This is what Wikipedia says. And yes, I'm cribbing from Wikipedia. Um, um, so all y'all that like want to be haughty about it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it, you know, listen, stop it. Um, anyways, Project 2025 is a plan to reshape the executive branch of the United States federal government in the event of a uh, Republican victory in the 2024 presidential election. Established in 2022, the project seeks to recruit tens of thousands of conservatives to Washington, D.C. to replace existing federal civil service workers it characterizes as the deep state to further the objectives of the Republican president. Although participants in the project cannot promote a specific presidential candidate, and that's probably because of, of uh, rules, you know, like um, campaign rules, um, it is deeply tied to, to Donald Trump and his campaign. It's the reason they want him to win. The plan would perform a swift takeover of the entire executive branch under a maximalist version of the unitary executive theory, a theory that proposes proposes that the United States of America has absolute power over the executive branch upon inauguration. Uh, proposing the president of the United States has absolute power over all of the executive branch upon uh, uh, inauguration. And this would do things like um, uh, all the things like the DOJ, Department of Justice, all the things that have any type of independent control that are able to investigate the president or Congress or anybody, that would be removed. They would all answer to the person that uh, uh, they would all answer to Donald Trump. So it would be removing all of the, the, the accountability mechanisms within the system under the idea of, oh, we're just beating the, you know, the, the administrative state. The, uh, the deep state is like a problem that's trying to ruin America. No, it would be the opposite. It would give all the power uh, um, to Donald Trump when he becomes president to be able to say what the judiciary does, to be able to say, like, to have power over everything, including to pardon all of his friends and homies himself to um, place. Look what he did in his last election. Look at the people that he placed into power. At all levels of government, yeah, especially you the had judges, the judges, right? And that was step one. That was just for, that was just for practice. <laughs> that was that was practice. So I throw that at you guys here at the end of the show, right? Now, now have I convinced you with that? Does that scare you at all? Does that make you think, oh wow, well we got to beat this. We can't have this happen. I mean, I think the challenge, like for us, yeah, like that that mean something like knowing the judges federal judges and and things like that are you know i still go back to like you know the the folks who have not been voting 50 percent. like i don't think that's enough to get that 50 percent. and the ones who are thinking about you know abstaining or voting for you know someone who absolutely can't win i i don't know if that you know uh gets them to think like, oh, I better vote, right? Like, uh, I'm just thinking about like the, the folks who are struggling the most in this economy, in this system, in the penal system, whatever systems that that are crushing them. I don't know if a, if a what is it? Trump 2025, whatever that uh, uh, webpage, one that they'll even be interested in hearing about it, you know, cause they're still like, how does that, you know, change my reality either way? Same thing. I'm very fam I'm familiar with Project 2025. Project 2025 I've, yeah, yeah they, they've been talking about this. Like some people like might even think of it as conspiracy theory. I know I've been in informal conversations with people from, you know, from a secretary to someone who's a retired scholar. And they're like, yeah, well, when he gets in, he's going to rewrite the Constitution like it's as a, a, a fact. Right. Um, and it's real interesting from the differing type of people that I heard this from in like the last three days. <laughs> Um, but I would also even say that if you're familiar with the Powell memo in 1972, what they wrote about there about the fear of kind of uh, uh, left wing or socialist causes kind of messing up business interest and what needed to be done to influence the Supreme Court. And then Lewis Powell ended up getting appointed to the Supreme Court after that by Nixon. A lot of people don't know this. But like when we're talking about this right now, I think that's part of the course. Right. What we're witnessing right now is kind of this empire kind of like turning in itself, right? It's mythology kind of turning into itself. It's kind of division within the uh, 
you know, with between whites, right? The dominant group within this society against each other somewhat, where it's always like 50%, 50%, right? On both sides. And the reliance on fo- on black folks, on, on, on non-whites to kind of prop up one side against the other when the majority on the other side is the majority dominant group within this society. I think Donald Trump represents that continuity, right? When we're talking about what this society always was, it's always been anti-immigrant. It's always been xenophobic. You know what I mean? It's always been kind of like, oh, well, survival, the fittest kind of like scientific racism nonsense like this. This whole John's built off of that. So like to turn around and be surprised or shocked by Trump, like, come on, you ain't paying attention. Also, at the same time, I would want to see the increase of activism once that goes down. Because if that does go down, you will see, like after 2016, I remember like everybody's like, oh my God, like uh, women in the suburbs, white women in the suburbs waking up and like, how did this happen? You know, and then became more active, became more engaged. And that type of grassroots activism sometimes join book clubs, had safety pins on their jackets, let you know that you were safe when you walk by them. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I remember. <laughs> but like that, that's the type of thing that happens when it becomes that. And so like, I don't wish that, but sometimes you got to hit rock bottom in order to understand, hey, we're at rock bottom and we got to change course. Uh, I think it was David, Henry David Thoreau that said, not until you're completely lost and turn around and then you start to find yourself. You begin to find yourself. And I think this country needs to hit that rock bottom at some point because this illusion, this, this, you know, circus and bread stuff that goes down, all these type of things. Like folks is debating about Yasin Bey and, and Drake, what he said about Drake. When you actually listen to the interview, Yasin Bey is basically saying what I'm saying right now, how that's a reflection of the disintegration of this empire right in front of our eyes. And, and I think that like folks need to be able to speak honestly about it. We also got to imagine something different. And sometimes we can't imagine something different until we realize, wait, this route that they always told us to go down is not a real route to go down. And I don't know if we're at that point yet, but we're pretty damn close. And I think a second Trump presidency might be the precipice that puts a lot of people in the position where they start questioning that. Now, will I vote for Trump? Hells nah. Not in a million years. Like, it's the worst thing ever. Am I going to vote for Cornell West? Probably. Even though he has no choice, no chance, uh, I might be a little worried if he did become president. Um, but at the same time, that makes I no know, sense. What are you talking no, about? But, like, let me, let me finish <laughs> this thought. What does that mean? <laughs> no, that's what I'm saying. Let me finish this thought. Yeah. But the values in which he represents, yeah. the legacy that he represents, the folks that he has been consistent about, like doubling down on ideas that aren't popularly right now good for politicians to double down on, he's doubling down on. And I think this mm-hmm. just demonstrates this man's real true honesty to the values in which he espouses. And I can't say that about Joe Biden. I, I mean, you can say that about Donald Trump, which is scary, but I would even say that doesn't even apply to Donald Trump. So yeah. like when we're talking yeah. about these type of things, that's where I'm sitting and I'm situated at. I'm actually ashamed that I voted for Joe Biden last time. And not because well, I'm not. It, yeah, not because Trump, you know, <laughs> against Trump. I'm yeah. more ashamed that I told myself a while ago that I wouldn't do that because like sacrificing our values sometimes in order to get the lesser of two evils ends up to still be the evil situation that we find ourselves in. And we find ourselves in a more precarious position now that, like I said before, ultimately might produce a situation where folks start imagining something different. And I know that's a radical idea. Hopefully I don't get in trouble for saying anything like that. But like at the same time, like we some sometimes not until you're completely lost or turned around, do you begin to find yourself? Um, And and maybe that's what needs to happen. I swear, just like two weeks ago, if you would have said that to me, I would have not have been about it. And as of this morning, even in thinking about talking about this. Yeah, I feel like. Well, first of all, let me just say a couple of things. I know we got to wrap. Uh, the reason that I stay in Minnesota, the reason I still live in Minnesota is because I need to be close enough to Canada. Like mentally, I just need to be close enough to Canada that if this joint is ever on fire, that I can swim there if I had to. I could run there. I could walk there. I could, somehow I got to get to Canada, right? And I'm not that far. Um, uh, probably for a swim or a run or whatever. Yeah, it's not, it's not happening. But in terms of driving, I need to mentally be able to get to another place because... I think that if 20, the plan that I just talked about 2025 project, if that were to happen, um, they would be installing a worldview that I think all of us deserve. 
I think we deserve what would happen because of our biases and our bigotry. We are playing into a game where they are going to install uh, um, a very retro government that they've always wanted, a super white supremacist uh, new governing system that they've always wanted, a conservative, white conservative, big money takeover of the American government and an outlawing of everything that has to do with diversity, has to do with race, what has to do with sexual minorities, has to do with um, separation between church and state. And when I say church, one church, not all churches, but one church. The, the, the thing about it is I, I do believe it, the the right, white racist evangelical church, which is basically not a church of Christ, it's a church a church of Mammon. It's a church of money, um, and and every and they can, they they remake Jesus and they remake God in the image of the dollar. Um, so um, so that's their religion, and that's the the church that would not be separated from state anymore. So in terms of those of us that talk all this kind of radical stuff that we talk, um, it would be the dark days. It would be the beginning of the mid medieval ages. To allow them to take everything over but but this is where i believe what dr king said about the you know the arc of uh of the universe is long and it bends towards justice everywhere that there has ever been people that get uh into oppressed status once it gets bad enough they start to understand their oppressed status and they start to fight back because the natural inclination of human beings is to be free so while they are still comfortable in their oppression, they they are are they are neutered. They 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 you don't have to worry about them. All the people I mentioned, the gays, the blacks, the immigrants, all those people are are comfortable right now, and they won't be with the project twenty twenty five. So maybe the project twenty twenty five is the beginning of the next revolution for us because you got to shock people into a realization of what their country is about and what's going on. Cause right now, everything that I'm saying, you know, people probably don't see, like you said, you know, person on the street might not even care about any of this right now. They'll care once it's installed. Once the president can decide who goes to jail and who doesn't and can waive all you know procedures and policies and all that, who can talk, who can speak, what words they can say, uh, where they can say it. Um, I mean, you've had whole countries outlaw everything we're talking about. Yeah, right. I mean, but Chris, the, the, uh, my thing would be, and, and a lot of like what you all are saying resonates, you know, um, there was someone who said like, you know, what the, the majority of people get the leader they deserve, right? So whatever their mindset is, the leader, even though it may be more concentrated and more vile, it is their mindset manifested, you know, so you get the leaders that you deserve in, in those kind of um, spaces. And Asada would talk about, like, you get used to everything, you know, um, and at some point you get used to your oppression and don't even realize that's what it is. Um, and Malcolm talks about, you know, um, as long as people are sad, they don't do anything. They got to be angry first, right? Like, and that's when you see action happening. Um, but he also talked about, you know, the uh, you know, one of the big problems, and this I think may have been um, Hampton or Stokely, where they talk about that, you know, the big problem is sometimes organizing people who are asleep and they got to be jolted awake and then you can organize. You can't organize the sleeping people, you know, but my, my thing is like all of the things that you mentioned, like right now, I think in Georgia, they were trying to pass laws where you couldn't protest. Right. And so they don't need a president to do that. There's already places where folks like just imagine like and I'm just no no wait a second though I don't mean to cut you off no no good they do need a president to nationalize those things to and they're trying them out they're trying them out, yeah. trying In different them out spaces, like, so yeah. so secret as it's been told Florida outlawed a lot of protest stuff mm -hmm. um, um, Oklahoma made it legal to run over protesters with your vehicle. They wrote that into law. They also wrote into law, um, you can't film police officers. See, this is a trial run. Mm -hmm. They're trying it in Oklahoma, Texas, Florida, these different places. But imagine now the, the president has the federal authority to take all of those things. I mean, he's the one who started the CRT bans. Christo he saw Christopher Rufo mm -hmm. on Tucker Carlson and invited him to, to come the in, White House. To help, help nationalize it. Yeah. And they nationalized what started in Seattle. 
The whole CRT thing started in Seattle with one white teacher who was disgusted by the the um, diversity training that they were getting and thought that it was anti-white and leaked that to Christopher Rufo, who took it and said, this is gold. There have got to be a lot of white people who are sitting in places like this who feel the exact same way. That's how the CRT thing started. Think about the power system of one white teacher getting something to some to one 30 something white male mediocre documentary maker who then ends up on Tucker Carlson on the most watched TV program ever with another mediocre white male. And then that gets him called to the White House um, by a president who's one of the most unfit people ever. So we are talking a chain of white men that were able to. America. Now, Listen, show me a black, show me a black power or a gay power, a power power anywhere that's able to go from sitting in a training at a, in a school district that you don't like to having a national ban on, on books and, and words you don't like and theories and scholars. Mm. Show me somebody else. And that takes, I think, that's the point I was going to make about what you're saying. That takes a president. Yeah. That takes a president and a takeover of the state and a takeover of the government. Uh, that they've always wanted. <laughs> there go my balloons again. <laughs> Anyways, I know we got to wrap y'all. Um, this has been another riveting barbershop type of conversation. Y'all want to do a final word? Is there any final words you have on this? Uh, it's 2024. This is going to be election year. How should black folks be thinking? Stay woke, y'all. Stay woke. Yeah, ha ha have faith in uh, in what could be possible, not what is. Yeah. Um, both of those are really hopeful. Um, you all going to die. Um, that, that's my, my final word right now is if you don't think it's that serious, if you don't think the gravity die, of our situation. What, what's the stance that you're in when you're, when you're dead, you know? So. Thank you. Thank you. So anyways, this has been another episode of Freedom Friday and you are still not free, but hopefully you are freer after this hour with all of us uh, uh, on the show. We appreciate you as always. Share the show. Uh, share it around, give it to others and leave a, uh, a review wherever you get the show. We appreciate you as always. We'll see you next time on Freedom Friday.